Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net. And today I'm gonna to be sharing with you the biggest barrier to shadow integration. All right, so in today's video, I'm gonna be sharing with you the biggest barrier to shadow integration. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the shadow and what shadow integration is first. So the shadow is basically a part of the unconscious mind where we put parts of ourself in order to forget about them. We basically impose a blind spot over parts of ourself where we're no longer aware of those aspects of ourself, despite the fact that they are aspects of ourself. And when we become unconscious to these aspects, they become autonomous from our conscious personality, which is the part of ourselves that we call me or I. And shadow integration is where we're reincorporating those repressed parts back into the personality. We're essentially re-becoming those parts of ourselves. And so the biggest barrier to shadow integration is idealism. What this means is clinging to the parts of ourself that we've labeled good or ideal or desirable and pushing away the parts of ourself that we've labeled as bad, unideal and undesirable. Now, oftentimes when people hear this, they go, well, of course I wanna get rid of the bad parts of the personality. Of course I wanna get rid of the shameful parts. Of course I wanna get rid of what's negative. But the issue here is that there are no inherently negative aspects of the personality. When it comes to the parts of ourself that we push away and put in the shadow, all of those aspects are fundamentally neutral and they can either be expressed in more conscious and beneficial ways or more unconscious and negative ways. And when we push these parts of ourself away into the shadow they don't just go away and they're much more likely to express outwardly in unconscious and negative ways because they're unconscious to us and so from the shadow they tend to control us and, and manipulate us into doing things that are unwise or unhealthy or unhelpful and when we push away these parts of ourselves that we have labeled as negative, two things happen. One is that it creates a split within us that produces shame around this aspect. So it produces the feeling of shame. And then the second thing that it does is it gets us out of connection with the positive potentials of that aspect so that only the negative potentials are coming through. And this is why clinging to the identity of goodness tends to be the biggest barrier to integration, where we're hyper-identified with being good in some way or desirable in some way, and we push away whichever qualities of ourself that we consider negative or undesirable. And so this is why it's very important for us to hold space for all of the elements of ourself, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because once we go to push those parts of ourself away or we try to get rid of those parts of ourself, it tends to backfire and lead to much worse outcomes. So to explain the importance of accepting both the positive and the negative in yourself, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Tao. Um, and so this is a representation of the Tao. It's oftentimes called the yin and yang symbol. And so basically in this symbol, what we have is the symbol represents wholeness, and that's why it's a circle, but it also has two sides to that wholeness. So we have a dark side and a light side. And within the light side, we have a dark spot. And within the dark side, we have a light spot. And what this represents is that within everything, there is wholeness. Within all things that we consider to be positive, there's negative. Within all things that we consider to be negative, there's positive. And we have to hold space for all things, you know, on both sides of the spectrum in order to have a true representation of the perfect wholeness of that which is. And the Tao can be found in all things. So, you know, from a grain of sand to all of the cosmos basically has both the positive and negative polarities within it. And so if we are to come into a state of peace and wholeness with other things, we have to accept both the positive and the negative polarities in all things. And it's the same way when we orient to ourselves. The human personality is also a reflection of the Tao. And so we have both a yin and a yang side, a positive and a negative side. And so we must embrace all all of those parts of ourself in order for us to recognize the wholeness. And basically with shadow work, what we're trying to do is we are trying to embrace our wholeness. So that's what shadow work, the long and short of it is, it's a path to wholeness. And it is a path to realizing yourself as the Tao itself. 
So it's important to recognize that you contain both the positive and the negative. You contain both the dark and the light. You contain all pairs of opposites within yourself. And so one of the things that's going to be the most helpful for your shadow work practice is to accept all opposites within yourself and to accept all opposites outside of yourself as well. So if you can hold space for all pairs of opposites, then you are taking a huge step forward with shadow work. It's a huge shortcut with shadow work. But when it's the case that we get into idealistic mindsets and we start to hyper identify with goodness to the exclusion of badness or hyper identify with positivity to the exclusion of negativity or hyper identify with anything that we have deemed good or desirable to the exclusion of what we consider bad and undesirable, what happens is that we start to come out of alignment with this natural wholeness that we have. So we are naturally whole and perfect as we are. But when it's the case that we start to say, oh, these are the good parts and those or the bad parts, we split ourselves and we push parts of ourselves into the shadow and now we get this distorted expression of that wholeness. And it's like taking the symbol of the Tao and trying to take all the black parts out of the Tao and it takes away all of the meaning from the symbol. And what ends up happening is that we end up with a situation where we're only identifying with what the human mind conceptualizes of as ideal. But the human mind is very, very limited in its understanding of what is ideal and what's perfect. What's already ideal and perfect is everything exactly as it is because everything is already whole. Now, through the human lens, through our human limitations, we see mistakes everywhere, but there are no mistakes in the absolute sense. And when we hyper identify with goodness to the exclusion of badness and the positive to the exclusion of negative, or let's say we hyper identify with one quality that we deem as desirable and to the exclusion of the opposite quality, which we deem as undesirable, what ends up happening is that we trade in that deep and perfect wholeness for a very shallow and flawed human ideal. You see, the human mind doesn't understand what's actually perfect and doesn't understand what's actually ideal because our idea of what's ideal is just what suits us, you know, what serves us the most. But in the absolute sense, perfection and wholeness is simply the state of things exactly as they are. And we as human beings might look at things and go like, ooh, that's not good for our survival or that's not, not, not pleasant for us or that's not good for us. And so we have these ideals which are practically useful in, in a limited context. But when we start thinking about like, you know, how things should be, you know, in terms of ourself and in terms of things outside of ourself, we start to blot out all of the, the recognition of the perfection and wholeness of that which is by placing over top of it the idea that it should be something else. It should match up to some other ideal. And that's where we run into issues with the shadow. So the aim of shadow work is never to become more ideal, is never to improve yourself, is never to fix yourself or change yourself or heal yourself. Shadow work is all about becoming more whole. It's about embracing all things that are within you, the positive and the negative. And it's about coming into a deeply loving relationship to all things positive and negative within you and all positive and negative things that you've experienced in your life. And so if you want so if you want to practice shadow work, you want to toss away idealism and you want to embrace yourself, warts and all, the good, the bad, and the ugly, just as you are. Now, one caveat that I want to mention here is that this doesn't necessarily mean that we need to express ourselves in detrimental ways. In fact, I would recommend finding positive ways to express all of your qualities. When it comes to integration and when it, becomes to, when it comes to recognizing that wholeness, what we want to do is we want to recognize that all things exist there within ourselves. And we want to take all of those and start to express them in their most exalted forms. And so if we notice, for example, greed within ourselves. We want to embrace greed, but we don't want to express greed. We want to recognize the roots of where that comes from, and we want to reframe and reorient ourselves to those qualities in such a way that they come through in positive ways. You know, so what greed is, is it's basically like a response to um, scarcity. And so if we have this part of ourself that feels this sense of scarcity, what we want to do is we want to fill in that need in a way that's not greedy. And then we want to utilize the part of ourself that's coping through greed in a different way that's more suited to its strengths. 
So don't worry, you don't have to behave badly or you know mess up your relationships or mess up your life in order to embrace wholeness. You can embrace both the positive and the negative within yourself without expressing in ways that are harmful to yourself or yourself or others. Now in just a moment, I'm gonna talk a little bit more of this tendency to hyper-identify with goodness to the exclusion of badness and hyper-identifying with the positive to the exclusion of the negative. But first I wanted to mention something. So my husband, Richard Kodak, he uh, is actually in the pre-order process for his movie Re Room Zero and I wanted to get that information out to as many people as possible. It's available for pre-order on Apple TV and also on iTunes and so if you want to go there and you want to pre-order his movie this gives him the best possible chances of getting high in the ranking on Apple TV which could open you know more opportunities for him to make future projects and to give him the best possible chances as his wife, I'm offering a, a complimentary one-on-one -on -one 30 minute session with me for anybody who pre-orders his movie. And so if that's something that you're interested in, I'll leave a link down below in the description box and in the comments. All right, so whenever it's the case that we end up hyper identifying with what we consider ideal and positive and good to the exclusion of what we consider unideal, negative and bad, this creates a dynamic that I refer to as an oppositional split. And so what an oppositional split is, is where we hyper-identify with a part of ourself to the exclusion of whatever we consider its opposite to be. So that could be something like fun and serious, or helpful and unhelpful, or masculine and feminine, or passive and aggressive, or you know any dichotomy of opposites can happen here. We would just have to project goodness onto one of those qualities and project badness onto the other quality. So for example, if I take passiveness and aggressiveness, Back when I was 12 years old, I used to think passivity was a really, really virtuous quality. Um, and I would think aggressiveness is really, really terrible. So I would kind of demonize aggressiveness and I would really put uh, passivity up on a pedestal because I'm like, oh, that's the chill person that can kind of go with the flow. Now, somebody else could decide the exact opposite. They could decide that, oh, aggression, that's what you need to be strong and that person can really stand up against the odds and that person's going to have the character, whereas somebody who's passive is just weak and you can't rely on them or, you know, this type of thing. And so we can project goodness onto either one of those qualities or badness onto either one of those qualities. And so we can have the exact opposite oppositional split to somebody else. And what ends up happening with these oppositional splits when we polarize like this is we end up overcompensating into the quality that we consider to be good to the point where that quality actually becomes a hindrance and we aren't able to actually pull the tools that we need to use from the quality that we've deemed as bad and so it creates this really kind of negative situation and so I'm gonna give um, a story from my own life around my hyper identification with passivity and being the chilled out one to the exclusion of aggressive um, aggressiveness and anger and this will give you a good sense of how this kind of shadow dynamic plays out so when I was about 12 years old, and maybe even a little bit before this, but when I was about 12 years old, I had really started to admire the qualities of being like laid back. And so uh, it, part of this was like me looking up to my dad. My dad's always been like a really like laid back person. And his whole thing that he feels very proud of actually is, is being able for everything to be like water off a duck's back, you know? So, so nothing really frazzles him too much. And like, it's almost like, you know, he's able to roll with the punches all the time. And so in looking up to my dad, I also started to look up to other usually like masculine figures where I would kind of see an element of that chilled outness. And I would have a very shallow understanding of these people and these figures. But like, let's say Bob Marley was one that like, I really kind of liked the imagery around him. I didn't know much about him, but I'm like, oh, he seems chilled out. Or like John Lennon, oh, he seems very, very like, chilled out. Or I would even go to famous figures, like let's say Gandhi, you know, I had like a very, very shallow understanding of what Gandhi was all about, but he had this vibe of like somebody who's like, you know, somebody who is willing to take a lot of things and can always kind of like keep rolling with the punches and, and somebody who can be very centered in themselves. And then I had like these kind of pop cultural notions of what the Buddha was like and what Jesus was like. And, you know, this idea of almost like, even if someone's 
crucifying you, you know, you still say like, oh, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And you have to, it's almost like this kind of martyrdom, like, you know, so it's almost like always roll with the punches, never, never fight back. If someone punches you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek. And so this was like, you know, a really strong identification for me when I was 12 years old. And it was something that I really aspired to. And to preface this, before I was 12, I had always had a really terrible self-esteem and like was just constantly dealing with nonstop shame. And so this was really the first time I had created an identity for myself where I really felt good about myself. And so what I would do is I would, you know, basically conceptualize of myself as somebody who was really chilled out, who never got angry about anything. And so what I had done is I had said, okay, being chilled out is an absolute unquestionable good. And then I, you know, being angry or aggressive in any way, or even assertive is an unquestioned bad. And so I had this really extreme polarization. And so what I would do is I would feel really good about myself. Like, let's say if, cause I was getting like bullied quite a bit throughout school, like when I was in elementary school and up into around this point in middle school. And so what would happen is like, you know, the people who would be bullying me and who would be unkind and mean, I would like let them do it and I wouldn't respond. And then I would feel superior to them because, oh, I'm the bigger person than them. And so I would start to feel like almost, I would get this ego inflation around it. Like, oh, look, how good I am. Even when people are coming and, and treating me like a doormat, I can, you know, f f roll with the punches and everything is going to flow off of me like water off a duck's back. And I felt like, you know, when I was identifying with this, I felt like this almost like super Zen warrior type that was able to take on anything that the world would have to offer me. And, but then it's like, if there were times where I had to set my boundaries, I wouldn't be able to do that because I had pushed um, aggression into the shadow. So anytime where someone would go over my boundaries and I would feel genuinely uncomfortable, it would be like, I wouldn't have any tools in my toolbox to use to set those boundaries. Boundaries. And so I ended up in a lot of situations where I wasn't able to exercise a lot of self-respect or, or set my boundaries or kind of push back on negative things coming at me. And so this identity, you know, what it caused me to do is to almost like hyperpolarize into, you know, this identity of being this good person and I was good because I was chilled out. But then in times where I would feel genuinely angry, I'd have to do this kind of double think in my own mind to kind of convince myself, number one, that I never get angry and that I just don't do that. Um, and number two, that like, you know, that I am, let's say I am a better, not that I'm afraid to stand up for myself and express anger, but that, oh, I'm just better than the other person who's going over my boundaries. And so I was in this constant nonstop competition. And so there was a lot of aggression going on, you know, underneath the surface where I was always competing with other people to be the most chilled out person. And this was the way that I was feeling superior to others because before I was always feeling lesser and one down. And so I would like adopt this idea of like, oh, I'm so chilled out and laid back. And that means I'm better than you and you and you. And so there was always this kind of like conquering warrior-like aggression that was happening, uh, you know, not in a way that maybe other people could see, but that was definitely going on in my own mind. And then externally, it would come through as like this, like very meek, you know, not setting boundaries, you know, not having any kind of self-respect. And so I ended up with, uh, let's say, negative expressions of both what I considered to be the negative polarity of aggression, because internally I was constantly being aggressive to other people and competing with other people in ways that only I was privy to because it was happening in my own mind. And then externally, I was displaying like the, the negative elements of what I considered to be the positive polarity of passivity. And so instead of like, let's say kind of coming across in the way that I wanted to come across as like this really like, you know, know, Zen and like, I can take anything and I'm like as tough as nails kind of thing. Instead, I was coming across as like weak and, you know, unable to set my own boundaries and not self-respecting. And this was all very, very extreme for me. A lot of times this will come through in more subtle ways for people, but I was really extreme with it. And so like, I remember one time and again, I was 12 and my cousin Colby, I guess he was about nine or 10. 
and we were having a discussion and I had, you know, bragging about my, my chilled out nature, you know, I had said, oh, I'll never stand up for myself because I believe that assertiveness is just wrong and I believe in pacifism and, and nonviolence in any kind of way. And so he pushed back on this. He's like, what if someone comes and they like try to like beat you up? And I'm like, oh yeah, I would just let them. I would just totally let them. And part of me wonders, because I never actually faced with that kind of thing. I wonder if that would snap me out of it and I'd fight back or if I would just kind of like in that moment just go into freeze mode and convince myself that I was the bigger person for like letting the person like beat me up. And so in this instance, I had a really strong oppositional split where I had labeled passivity as good and aggression as bad. But keep in mind that in the box is labeled passivity and in the box is labeled aggression. There's both good and bad qualities in both of those boxes. So in the box that's labeled passivity, you have someone that can roll with the punches, somebody who picks their battles, somebody who's able to, you know, potentially do something like a Gandhi does, you know, where it's like a non nonviolent resistance and part of nonviolent resistance is just the willingness to kind of have the state <laughs> come back on you or the oppressive force come back on you and then other people start to see that oh hang on these nonviolent people are being you know are being harmed and so then people get outraged and they get involved in the they get involved in the movement too. These are contexts that I did not understand at the time around nonviolent resistance movements and things like that, is that there's a reason for the martyrdom. You know, there's a reason for, you know, allowing like a nonviolent resistance because of how it spurs on the populace and, and raises awareness about a particular issue. Um, but my only cause at the time was just that I wanted to prove myself a morally superior person by being chilled out because I didn't like myself. I, I really had this deep sense of self-hatred. And so on that side of the things, those are sort of some of the positive qualities of being that person that's more passive. On the negative side, you have somebody who doesn't respect their own boundaries, that doesn't assert their own boundaries, isn't aware of them, it doesn't practice self-respect, and then basically that person like leaves their entire energy open for other people to come in and, and ransack it, basically. It's almost like the person who doesn't lock away, you know, their, their goods and then someone comes in and like steals everything from them. That's basically like the, the negative polarization of, um, of uh, passivity. Now, on the other side, you have aggression. So the positive side of aggression is the uh, aggression is the ability to set boundaries and the ability to assert yourself and the ability to say, hey, I'm, I'm worth fighting for here. Like I can set my boundaries and I can keep myself safe. Now, the negative um, elements of aggression are, of course, you know, combativeness and conflict and, you know, unnecessary fights, picking fights all the time. And of course, that's negative. But it's only when you accept both sides of that polarity, both aggression and passivity, that you get to express the positive sides of aggression and passivity. Once you split it, you're only going to mostly express the negative sides of both. And so in all polarities that we have within ourselves and we contain all polarities that are possible for a human being to contain, within all of those polarities, what we want to do is we want to hold space for the positives and the negatives of both sides of that spectrum. And we don't want to label one side as bad and the other side as good and really split ourselves in that way. We want to be able to be nuanced and we want to recognize that we have both the positive and negative within ourselves and it only express the positive but to be aware that those negatives exist within us because those are the roots to our tree so the fruits we can have the fruits only express the positive but we have to have our roots dug deeply into the negative and the positive so it's very important with this to recognize that there are no bad qualities within the personality, there are no bad parts of the personality. It really just depends on how we express those parts. We can express those in positive beneficial ways or negative detrimental ways but there's no inherently bad part of the personality. So when we're doing shadow work, what we're actually doing, we're not integrating the bad parts of the personality. What we're doing is we're integrating the parts of ourself that we've gone unconscious to, the parts of ourselves that we've labeled as bad and pushed away because we deem them as bad. But these parts of ourself, you know, uh, like have the golden shadow. Now the golden shadow is the idea of the positive stuff in the shadow, but I would argue that actually everything down in the shadow is actually a golden shadow if you 
express it the right way. So what I would say is that like there's no inherently negative parts of the self. Embrace everything that's there and then you'll find that those parts express in much more positive ways. So with that in mind, I want to share an exercise with you um, and I call it the flip the script exercise. So in this exercise, it's about redefining what we've considered negative as the positive. So in my example where I thought, oh, aggression bad and uh, let's say passivity good, you know, what I want to do is I want to look at what's actually good about aggression. I want to find the things within that. I want to find the diamonds in the rough where I say, oh, actually aggression, I can find assertiveness within aggression aggression, forward movement within aggression, boundary setting within aggression. So it's looking at, you know, like what's a new reframe to even maybe even call it a different thing. So instead of saying aggressiveness, I might say something like assertiveness or fierceness, you know, whatever has a more positive connotation. And so any quality that you have negative associations with, you want to find the positive elements of that. So keep in mind, if you have a box with the label of that, that negative quality, no matter how un inherently negative it might seem, it could be something like the box could literally be labeled bad, right? And so we go, oh, of course I want to push away the badness. But when we look in that box labeled bad, we have both positive and negative qualities in there, depending on how we're defining the word bad. And so anything that we would look at and go like, let's say strong versus weak. And it's like, well, of course being strong is better than being weak. But keeping in mind, we're using the label of weak specifically because we consider these qualities negative. And so we're using a word that has a negative connotation to label the whole box of these qualities. And if I looked in the box that's labeled weakness, I would find things like vulnerability and emotional sensitivity and the ability to connect with others because I'm like softer and, and not hardened up. You know, so there's lots of positives in there, even though the word that I would be using to describe this quality, these qualities is very, very negative. And so Anything that you would consider as a negative quality that you don't want to have as part of you, no matter how unquestionably negative that thing is, you want to look for what is the positive reframe of those qualities that you're labeling, labeling as bad or negative. And then on the flip side, what you want to do is you want to see all of the qualities that you consider good or that you hyper identify with and you think, oh, I want to be that way. This is the best way to be. You know, no matter how much of an unquestioned good these things are, think about them as a big box again, it's got the label of whatever it happens to be. So let's say if we have, say strong versus weak, it's like, oh, of course I want to be strong. Being strong is better than weakness. But if we look in the box labeled strength, we do have positive qualities there, you know, like the ability to like, let's say be resilient in situations and to, to keep pushing forward and to keep persevering. All of that's good. But then strength can also lead to things like rigidity, you know, and basically continuing to push forward and to persevere and to make things work even when it's better to reorient our uh, focus elsewhere. And so keeping in mind that even these positive qualities that seem like an unquestioned positive also have negative aspects. And so looking in the box with the label of that positive quality, you want to find both the good and the bad within it. And so keeping this in mind, to think about the Tao symbol, right? So we have both positive and negative in all things and all positive things contain negative and all negative things contain positive. And so basically this exercise is designed to get you to recognize the positive and the negative and the negative and the positive. And when you can do this, you're a lot less prone to creating these oppositional splits within yourself because you can recognize that you contain all pairs of opposites and that each one of those pairs, there's no absolute good or bad within those. There's positive and negative within every pair of opposites. And you want to be able to embrace all things within yourself so that you can express these qualities in the most exalted expression is po that is possible for them. And this also helps you get rid of any sense of grasping towards certain positive qualities or aversion toward any of these supposed negative qualities. And that way you're able to, instead of having this polarization and this split, you're able to come back into a state of integration and wholeness with yourself. And when you're able to drop resistance to all things and their opposite, and you're able to hold space for all dichotomies within yourself, that's going to be a huge leap forward with your shadow work practice. It's practically a shadow work shortcut. So the more you depolarize yourself, the more that you hold space for both, both sides
sides of it, any kind of spectrum within yourself, the better that you're going to do with your shadow work practice because it's more in alignment with wholeness. Anyway, so that's all I have for you for now. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead, click the like button down below and subscribe and check out my husband's movie, Room Zero. And that's all I have for now. And until next time, keep becoming more you. Thank you.